Outlaws of Thunder Junction is pretty freaking cool, so we're going over the top 10 must-have commander cards from the set. I'm Mia, and I like it when Miso joins us. I'm BZ, I love changing the sign, and we're the Nitpicking Nerd, sponsored by Card Kingdom, our favorite way to go buy or sell Magic the Gathering cards, which can be done on the internet. I would recommend using cardkingdom.com. You can also get sealed product there and supplies, so go check it out. $50 or more gets you free shipping on singles, and use the link Tell Them That We Sent You. Also, Dragon Shield's best sleeves in the multiverse. Good sleeves. If you use the code NERDS at checkout, you can save 5% of your real money tax dollars on your entire order. Miso uses Dragon Shield all the time for his sleeve needs. And we're also sponsored by Moxfield, but you're going to be hearing from them a little later. And if you want to sub to our Patreon, that's the best way to support the channel directly while also getting sick perks like exclusive spell table gameplay with other content creators and an exclusive podcast that we do, among other things. Maybe even get something mailed to you. Help the cats go to college. Misu needs it. Look at him. Oh, he has no thoughts. So this is Outlaws of Thunder Junction. There's like six different versions of this set. We're putting them all into one video. We're just going over the 10 must-have cards from every possible version of Outlaws. And we're just talking about new cards, so no reprints, because that's not as exciting. So we're gonna get into, uh, actually, honorable mentions. These weren't quite good enough to make the list, but we wanted to talk about them. I really enjoy my honorable mention. It's Tower Winder, one in green for a 1-1. One, one. Basically, if it's in your library or your graveyard, you get Command Tower to your hand. I think that's super cool, especially if you are doing like some sort of mill shenanigans, or you're just trying to find Command Tower in general because you're trying to color fix you. Yeah, it's got Reach and Death Touch, which are nice abilities to have. I would say if this was a one mana 1-1 one, one with like no abilities, it really wouldn't be that exciting. My one thing that I worry about a little bit with this card is like, if Command Tower is in play, it basically does nothing and that's not all the time but it is some percentage of the time it's just something i worry about i'm an anxious person yeah you really are but i do like the fact that it does fetch from the graveyard now that's kind of a new one that we've seen yeah so even if you have command tower in play if your deck has like sack outlets on lands then it won't even really matter because you can just get it back mine is rumbleweed this is a 10 green 88 the 50th version of this effect but it costs one less for each land in your graveyard which i think is great for graveyard decks or land decks any deck filling the graveyard for any reason this will be good or just if you have fetch lands and then it gives you an overrun on your team so like I feel like it's a little specific, maybe for this top 10, but I definitely wanted to talk about it. I mean, having that finisher on a creature is super nice. I know green has a ton of ways to give it trample and extra stats, but having it on a creature with creature synergies, I think can really push that deck over to the, the edge if you're really in a combat-focused meta. Right, so that brings us to our actual top 10 from the set. I will say, something we noticed when we were making this top 10 is the power band, uh, as it were, is pretty narrow. I think all these cards are pretty much very close in terms of power. So I would say maybe for this list in particular, the actual order matters less than how awesome these cards are, but we do, we did order them. We did figure out which ones we like the best. This is, I think, due to whether they're more specific or less specific or how many colors can really play them and all that. So let's get into it. At number 10, it's Lively Dirge. One in a black for sorcery, but it has spree, and spree does mean that you have to pay one or more additional costs. If you pay one more, you can search your library for a card, put it in your graveyard, and then shuffle. Or if you pay two more, you can return up to two creature cards with total mana value four or less from your graveyard to the battlefield, and then you can pay both of those if you want both of those effects. Yeah, so this is a 3-mana Tutor to the Graveyard, 3-mana Sorcery Speed and Tomb, or a 4-mana Reanimate Small Things, or for 5-mana you go get to get your best small thing and then reanimate. The thing that this screams to me is like combos. Uh, somebody did mention, I think, in one of the posts about this card, it, it kind of almost feels a little color pie breaky, where black doesn't search for creatures and put them into play. But lately we've been getting a few things that can do that. So I think breaking that is kind of funny. Uh, Beseech the Mirror does that, and uh, Lively of Dirge now does that. Mostly where this goes is, I think, dedicated combo decks with, like, you know, Samwise Gamgee and Cauldron Familiar sort of things, like where they have cheap two-card infinites that go off together, and this finds one, gets them both back if the other one's in the graveyard, and then you just win. I'd say if you're not playing a combo deck, this would be a little bit too slow for you. I could see maybe if you're playing the long game and you just want to, you have a lot of value, you're like milling or something, maybe, but it does seem a little bit slow for like the decks that are, are considered like sevens or, you know. Next up is number nine, Final Showdown. This is white for an instant, also has spree, plus one, all creatures lose all abilities until end of turn, plus one, choose a creature you control, it gains indestructible until end of turn, and plus three, white, white, destroy all creatures. So at an instant speed, this is an interesting effect. Six mana destroys all creatures, that's probably the baseline for this. 
that is the new best instant speed white uh, creature destroyer, I think, because we had Route before, which is five mana on your turn or seven mana at instant speed, but this is clearly better than Route. I really like this. I like the fact that there is an instant speed board wipe that's like somewhat playable. It's modal. So you can just, if you need, give something indestructible as like, you know, a little tricky thing. It's also a board wipe that functions as a protection spell for your best creature. If you're holding up something else and you have this in your hand also, that's nice. And I th I'm sure that get all creatures losing abilities can get you out of a pickle. You can target a hexproof creature now or, you know, some creature pumps itself and now that ability is gone because they lose all abilities, saves you from like a Voltron swing and combining these starts to get interesting because you can give all creatures lose all abilities and give your best creature indestructible which happens after that then destroy all creatures except your best creature or you can just you know mix and match obviously i really want to try this in my deck that wins with vicious shadows i think that could be super interesting having an instant speed board wipe on hand this is my only problem with the card though i don't know where i'm supposed to play this because white it has such good board wipes that it's almost boring when a new white one comes out because yeah, this card's good and it seems cool, but I feel like I'm never going to play it because I've got Farewell, Vanquish the Horde, you've got even lower stuff like Tragic Arrogance, Austere Command, Little Wrath. even the 4-mana Wraths are way cheaper than this. I don't know. I just don't know where I'd play this. I'm almost sick of having such good options because it means that cool stuff like this gets sort of left behind. I think I'm going to test this out, though. I think that especially if you are building on a budget, I feel like this is one that might fall. This could be a cool, like, draw go, you know, where you have a lot of instants and instant synergies. That could be sweet. I think so, too. Number eight, High Noon, one in a white for an enchantment. Each player can't cast more than one spell each turn. Or if you pay four in a red, you can sack it. It deals five damage to any target. If you're in Boros, this is a strictly better rule of law. It gives the opportunity to deal damage if you want to pay that five mana, or it can just limit and slow down your opponents who might be trying to chain spells for the win. This is not an exciting card. It is not a very fun card, but it is a very effective card. Rule of law shuts down decks and slows down decks very, very effectively. And I love that they made it a mana cheaper for nothing. You don't pay anything extra, and you just get a bonus. Obviously, you have to play this in Boros decks, so you, uh, in like a blue-white deck, you can't play this. But this is literally just better rule of law, but you can sacrifice it. So now if you have something big going on, you can pass your turn, make everybody else play under this thing. At the end step, sack it, deal five to someone's face, and then like storm off or cast multiple spells to win the game. I really like this. I have Rule of Law in my CEDH deck, and one of the things that I've had trouble with at times prior is the fact that I want to cast like Mana Crypt and then, you know, get a big creature on the board or something like that, and my own Rule of Law was hurting me. So in the higher powered games, the fact that you can sacrifice this and it comes down cheaper can really power up your deck, I think. As much as Moxville.com can power up your deck, because that's an online resource that if you haven't used by now, I don't know if I can help you, but stick around because we're going to say... That's the best way to build a deck. You might be using Redacted. You might even be using Redacted. But you should be using Moxfield. If you don't use Moxfield, you should go on there right now, import your deck, because it can import from lists from Redacted just by the URL or a text list, which is amazing. And then if you want to try out any of these new cards, just remove it and then easily add them in. They're already on there. Isn't that amazing? I think it's amazing, quite frankly. Now that Misa has joined us again, we get to go to an uncommon uh, next on the list. Number seven is Forsaken Miner. It's a black for a 2-2. Can't block. And whenever you commit a crime, which is targeting an opponent, their graveyard, anything on their battlefield, you can pay black. And if you do, you return Forsaken Miner from your graveyard to the battlefield. The thing that you won't see on the rest of this list is committing crimes. But the thing about committing crime payoffs is they're almost always limited to once a turn or at a certain time or no more than this many whatevers because... Committing crimes is sort of easy, and you don't, you don't have to commit a crime with a spell. You can commit a crime with an ability. So it's very easy to commit crimes in certain decks. And this doesn't have that stopgap on it. You can just keep bringing this dumb thing back over and over and over, which kind of makes it a combo piece. I really like this. I think it's super cool. It's like a cheaper reassembling skeleton, and it goes infinite with Pitiless Plunderer and Goblin Bombardment. You just target their stuff, kill it. When it dies, you get the treasure, you bring it back, and you do that a bunch of times until all of your opponents are dead. Yeah, targeting with Goblin Bombardment, if you target your opponents or their creatures, is committing a crime. And it's not like, guys, we broke Goblin Bombardment. Guys, we broke Pitiless Plunder. This just goes in those decks and makes them more consistent. And I think it's a card that's just kind of scary. I think even if you just have regular sack fodder. This is a card that you can easily recur multiple times, even just through removal spells and just sacrifice over and over. Just pairing this with like a Midnight Reaper just feels annoying to me. That's already good. If I know that they have even close to the infinite, like a Pitiless Plunder in their deck or something else, 
I will use Swords to Plowshares on this. It can get very scary, and if it's not scary, it'll just be value overall. Yeah, so how about number six? Number six, this is bringing an interesting archetype to this game. It's Rakdos the Muscle, two black, black, red for a 6-5 with flying and trample. Whenever you sack another creature, exile cards equal to its mana value from the top of the target player's library. Until your next step, you may play those cards, and mana of any type can be spent to cast those spells. Or if you sack another creature, Rakdos the Muscle gains indestructible until end of turn, tap it, activate only once each turn. What archetype is that? That is Rakdos Mill. Yeah, if that's what you want to call it. Maybe Rakdos Sacrifice is kind of where I'm looking at this. Uh, there's so much Rakdos Sacrifice, but the fact that you can use Rakdos, and if you can keep bringing something back, you can just mill all of your opponents out. That has not been seen in Rakdos before. No, it's definitely super cool. He wants sack outlets, uh, even after, even aside from himself. He's really hard to kill. He's indestructible, basically. I mean, you have to fire a removal spell at him, make him you know, sacrifice the creature to use a destructible and then fire another removal spell at him to even get around that because it can only be activated once. Or obviously, you know, Path to Exile, Swords to Plowshares, but this thing looks really tricky to kill. And even if you try to kill it, they can sacrifice their other stuff and just draw, like, effectively draw a bunch of cards, impulse draw them. That, I do like the fact that it is getting value off that. We've seen a lot of like, when it dies, you get mana and stuff, but getting card advantage and you can hit other people's libraries too. That's really fun, I think. I think this card is sick. You know, we're not talking about commanders as the leader of a deck, but this is in the, this is a 99 card. This card seems sick and I'm going to see it all over the place. And I think I'm going to be pretty annoyed at it because it's not even that expensive for what it does. It's a five mana. I know it wouldn't be good for the limited environment, but I wish this was uh, not rare so I could put it in my no rares Mahati, but that would have been terrible if this was a common. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we don't need to go over the ramifications of Rakdos the Muscle <laughs> at common, I think. But we do need to go over our number five card. It's Sword of Wealth and Power, three mana artifact that equips for two. Equip creature gets plus two, plus two, and it's protection from instants and sorceries. Whenever a equip creature deals combat damage to a player, you get a treasure token, and when you cast your next instant or sorcery this turn, copy that spell, you can choose new targets for the copy. This has a lot going for it. You always talk about the protection granted from other swords, like Sword of Feast and Famine gives protection from black and green. And we say, like, well, that's pretty good because now they can't kill your stuff with green or black cards. But this is all instant and sorceries. So basically any single target removal spell, this protects your creature from. However, despite it having the best protection of any of the swords of X and Y, it also has the worst evasion capabilities because nothing that's going to block it is an instant or sorcery. So you really can't get through to get the combat damage trigger. So you just need to make sure you're putting this on flyers and already things that are already evasive. I do agree that not having color protection makes it a little bit harder to swing in and get that combat damage trigger, but I do think that this is the best sword out of the swords of X and Y. I think the power it's really powerful to copy your next instant or sorcery, especially if you have access to a lot of colors and you can get hit like trample or you have the unblockable stuff. I, I think that's really cool. I don't think the original cycle of 10 swords of X and Y were that great in general. Nah. However, I do think it was easier to just throw Sword of Feast and Famine in your deck and have it do something. Uh, I think throwing this card into a random deck would not be great because you really need something with Trample or Flying or Unblockability or Shadow or whatever to get this through because the trigger for hitting is really, really good. It's so good. I just try and struggle where I think because it's like, okay, I want to have Trample, but I want to be casting a lot of Instants and Sorceries. But in the decks where I have a lot of Trample, I'm usually not casting that many Instants and Sorceries, right? So then I maybe want a Flyer or an Unblockable, and then I think of like Ninjutsu. And and this is an equipment, so it's not any of that stuff. Yeah, you know? so I think finding a home for this will be kind of tough, but when you do, I think this is going to slap so hard. Yeah, the card's sweet. I mean, maybe you even just play it as protection from instant sorcery, so it that, could that be like a weird lightning greaves in like the worst case scenario. Or if your commander just does something and you don't want people to block, maybe it can work. Who knows? We can, we can definitely see how this plays out. We'll, we'll workshop it. I'm really excited for this one. Number four, Avon Interrupter. One white white for a 2-2 two -two with flash and flying. When it ETBs, exile target spell. It becomes plotted. Spells your opponents cast from graveyards or from exile cost two more to cast. This has a lot of moving pieces, so when you exile the spell and it becomes plotted, you have to cast it on a later turn, and it's also only sorcery speed. So this eats counter spells, which is super cool, in mono white. And the fact that it just does tax people who are playing graveyard strategies or the exile strategies like the Prosper players, I think that this is a really good piece. Yeah, this doesn't stop the spell from resolving. It delays it an entire turn. And there are, like you said, some spells that it totally completely counters, like 
there's no way to cast a counter spell at sorcery speed. That's going to be great. Uh, delaying a board wipe might mean who cares that they can cast it for free next turn because they're dead this turn whenever I get to untap with this. This thing seems like a huge tempo win. And also, if it stays in play, now whatever spell they were trying to cast for free costs two more. And it's just like, it's a lot of taxing. And I also like that even after this resolves, you know, whatever, they try to play some card draw spell and you, you, you plot it and then they cast it next turn. Now you still have that static ability. It's still a thing. It's still a creature that does something in play. It still makes their graveyard and, and exile spells cost two more or less. Two less, two more to cast. And it's just going to shut down like cascade decks and just random flashback stuff. And I, I love the the extra synergy it has with like um, uh, Aerial Extortionist. These two guys just are like best friends. I really like being tricky. I love the fact that Mono White has little tricks now. The best trick prior was like Mana Tithe or giving up swords. It's like, oh, you're gonna swing at me? I guess I could uh, swords your thing. But no, this is super cool. I love to see it. Plus you can flicker it and just keep the party going. <laughs> Let's keep our party going to number three, Thunderclap Drake. This, when I read Thunderclap Drake, I'm not expecting the following text box, but that's just me. One in a blue for a 2-1 flyer instant and sorcery you cast costs one less, and you can pay two in a blue and sacrifice it to net. When you cast your next instant or sorcery spell this turn, copy it for each time you've cast your commander from the command zone this game. You can choose new targets for the copies. So we've already got flying two power goblin electromancer thing, and late in the game, if you've cast your commander even once or twice, let's say is at the low end, you just get to copy spells when this is no longer useful. Especially if you can evade that tax somehow by like a reduction. That could be super cool by just copying a big giant spell to just kill your opponents or just get a ton of value. This is just comes down really quickly. It's a reduction. I really like this card and I want to be putting it in my spell slinger deck. Oh yeah, I'm just going to stack this. With every spell slinger deck I own is about to get one of this card. I hope it's budget friendly. I, I don't see any reason for this to be like $5. Hopefully it's like a dollar so I can get it in my $50 decks, my $100 decks. Every spell slinger thing's just going to have this thing in it now. Isn't it like uncommon or something? I don't know. It doesn't really matter what the rarities of these commander precons because it just depends on how many people can get their hands on. Number two is a card that is going straight into my Galadriel deck. It's Oltec Matterweaver. Two and a white for a 2-4. Beefy boy. When you cast a creature spell, choose one. You can either create a 1-1 one, one colorless gnome artifact creature token or create a token that's a copy of target artifact token you control. So this is super cool because you can either make two bodies for one cast of a creature spell or you can be doubling other artifact tokens like your clues, your treasures, your junk maybe? Who knows? Power stones? Maybe. I think that this has a lot of utility. Yeah, so you're saying that each creature you cast, instead of counting as one body, normally now counts as two. Yes, or just another treasure or something else, really. Yeah, if you get if you want to go, you know, wacky and goofy, you can try to make copies of like Staff of Nin or something and then just start stacking them. That's really cool. We've got that we've got that uh settled for the brewers out there, but just for the people who want an efficient magic card, now for three mana you just get gnomes every time you cast a creature spell, and that's a really good card. This does a lot of things. Giving you rebates off of treasures is like especially scary. The only thing I would say to watch out for a little bit, it doesn't matter that much, but you do target the artifact tokens. So if you target, you know, it, it, it's always better to make a 1-1 gnome than to target a 1-1 gnome because they could technically kill the token in response and then you don't get the token. That is true. But if you're using like murder on my 1-1 gnome token, I'm going to ask like, do you have bigger things to worry about? That, that's more relevant if you've got like a six, you know, like a worm coil engine token you're trying to copy. True. But the 2-4 also is really nice coming down on turn two or three and just having a 2-4 already in play. Not a bad blocker. Probably turn three, but you know, maybe turn two. <laughs> maybe. Maybe if you've got like Lotus Petal. Soul Ring? Soul Ring, yeah. Well, we don't play that card, though. <laughs> we do sometimes, but not usually. And our number one card from Outlaws of Thunder Junction. I do think, as close as the rest of these were, that this card is number one. It's Insatiable Avarice. Well, another card was Spree. Black for a sorcery, plus two, search your library for a card, then shuffle and put the card on top, plus black, black. Target player draws three cards and loses three life. So... Generally, I'm looking at this card and I think baseline, this is black, 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 draw three, lose three, which is equivalent to like painful truths, or it's on the same scalability as like sign of blood. That's pretty sweet. But you can also in the late game add two mana to now of those three cards, one of them is your best possible draw. I like this card a lot. The first thing I thought of when I saw this was that Crick, Crick players are going to love this card. Probably. But in general, I do like the fact that you have that modal abilities. Sure, you need a tutor, put it up there. Sure, you might need some draw, put it in there. 
I think that this is a little bit better than the normal tutors that people get because it. I think it's less salty, right? It's sorcery speed. It costs a little bit more. You have to work for it a little bit more. And then it also puts it on top. It doesn't go straight to your hand like demonic tutor. So I, I really do like this. And I think some percentage of the time you're going to be casting this for three mana to just draw a card. So it's not like it's not a tutor in that case. I think this card is really playable. I will say mono black for sure. Two color black decks. You can play this pretty easily. I need to see your mana base uh, after that. But I feel like if you've got a blinged out, pretty good mana base without too many tap lands, you can play this in a three color deck without that much of an issue. I, I feel like especially with the Urborgs and all the fetchable duels, that it's not that hard. Honestly, with the treasures and stuff too, I think you can get the three black mana pretty easily. Yeah, so uh, what was your favorite card from this deck? Because I feel like my favorite one is Avon Interrupter. I love Avon <laughs> Interrupter so much. I also do like the Forsaken Miner. I, li I really like the combo potential. Coming to a combo near you, Forsaken Miner. And it's Ace Blavers. What a sick card. If you want to know what the pre-cons are looking like from this set, give this video a watch because it tells you everything you need to know about the pre-cons.